We are in section uh, four of chapter five, talking about types of aqueous solutions and solubility. So if we think about two aqueous solutions that you've probably encountered, um, one of those is salt mixed in water and the other is sugar mixed with water. The salt water is going to be a homogeneous mixture of sodium chloride and water, sugar water is a homogeneous mixture of uh, sucrose and water. And as you stir either of those substances into the water, it looks like it's disappearing, right? You can't see it anymore. It was a white crystalline substance, a solid. You put it in there, you stir it around. Where did it go, right? How does that happen? How do those solids dissolve in water? So we have to look at the interaction between the different types of particles when we mix the salt and the water. So here we have, this is illustrating the salt or the sugar, these purple balls. Um, that would be the solute. And there is a force of attraction between solute molecules. That's why it was a, the salt was a solid, right? If it had no attraction between the particles, they'd just fly apart. And there are attractions between the solvent, the water molecules, and the salt molecules. So there's those interactions. And then, what they don't actually specifically show here, there are also interactions between the solvent particles, the solvent molecules. So they're, they're all kind of pulling things in different directions. So this is pulling the solute together, trying to keep it together as a lump. This is pulling the water together and trying to keep the solid from getting into it. And then this one is pulling them apart. Yeah. So whether that solid dissolves or not depends on the relative strengths of those different interactions. And when, when you start reading those, it's a tongue twister and it doesn't seem to make much sense. So how are there attract attractions between molecules? Well, we have to talk about the charge distribution on a water molecule. There's actually an uneven distribution of electrons. So the oxygen end of the water molecule has the electrons spend more time over there. And so this has a partial negative charge. And so we use this lowercase Greek delta, which looks like a letter D with a posture issue. Um, that represents a partial charge. This is not a negative one ion. It might be a negative one fifth. It's a fraction of a charge. And then at the other end, the hydrogens have partial positive charges. So the water molecule can act like an electrical magnet, right? A magnet has a north end and a south end. Um, this is not magnetic. It's an electric force, but it also has two ends that are different. So when we put sodium chloride into water, here's our sodium ion with a positive one charge and our chloride ion with a negative one charge. And of course, those two ions are very attracted to each other. That's why it made sodium chloride. We've got opposite charges and they are attracting each other. But with the water molecule, one end of it is a little bit negative, and so that is attracted to this positive ion. And the negative end of the water molecule, I'm sorry, the positive end of the water molecule is attracted to the negative ion. So this water molecule by itself is not enough of a charge to convince sodium to leave its nice little crystal lattice. Do you have any questions about that? So you can think of ions and, and molecules as behaving a little bit like magnets. There's forces that attract them to each other or repel them from each other. And so the negative end of this molecule is attracted to the positive cation. 
opposites attract. So what can happen is we don't just have one water molecule getting attracted to this sodium ion. We get a whole bunch of them. And they begin to kind of surround this ion. And I think of it as you're luring it away. Oh, come, come play with me. I've got candy, right? It gets a little creepy, but you get the idea. So they're trying to convince this sodium ion to come away. And they're, they're trying to replace the force of attraction that it had with this chloride ion with the partial charge charges of several water molecules. And then the opposite, and yet the same, is happening with the anion. The positive ends of the water molecules are clustering around the negative ion and making up for the attraction that it lost in leaving the sodium chloride crystal. And so what we end up with in a salt solution is we have the individual cations and anions are separated from each other, but they're surrounded by water molecules, so there's little clusters. But these are free to move relative to each other. This sodium ion does not have to stay close to the, the chloride anion anymore. They're free to move around. Any questions? Yeah, this is representing a, a chunk of salt yeah. that's beginning to dissolve in the water. So that's why you can't see it because the, the water takes the heat of the... Yeah, so what happens, you, you can't see it anymore because this, this was really much bigger in order for us to be able to see it. Even those little teeny tiny salt crystals, right? Gazillions of, of ions in there. Yeah. But what happens in the water is they get taken apart. And the individual ion, even surrounded by a bunch of water molecules, still way too small to see. Yeah, that's a great question. Anybody else have any questions? Well, we can divide um, solutions into two categories, electrolytes and non-electrolytes. Um, so the electrolytes are substances that dissolve in water to make a solution that will conduct electricity. So this is electrolyte, like electricity, and non-electrolyte, these types of solutions do not conduct electricity. So the electrolyte solutions are going to contain soluble ionic compounds like sodium chloride or potassium nitrate, an ionic compound, because when that dissolves, it forms separate ions. The ions can move and they can carry the electricity through the solution. Here's um, an illustration of a beaker of water and a battery and a light, and there's two electrodes in here, they're not touching each other. When it's just pure water, the light bulb does not go on because water does not conduct electricity very well. Now it is true that if there's lightning, you should stay away from large bodies of water, right? And it's also true that if you're using power tools, you shouldn't be standing in puddles. But that isn't pure water. That's water with a bunch of stuff dissolved in it, probably a lot of dirt as well. Here we're talking about pure water. This really doesn't conduct electricity. But you dump some table salt in there, some sodium chloride, and it dissolves, and the light bulb goes on. In order for the light bulb to go on, there needs to be a complete circuit for the electrons to travel. So they have to be able to swim through the solution from one electrode to the other. And they can do that with the sodium ions and the chloride ions. That allows them to do that. Non-electrolytes don't conduct electricity. This would be most molecular compounds and so sugar is a molecular compound. You can dump all kinds of sugar in here and it's never gonna make that light bulb light up because sugar does not form ions in the solution. And this word electrolyte, you've probably heard in terms of exercise, right? And staying hydrated and you need your electrolytes. Well, it's used in very much the same way. In your body, there's a lot of electrical activity and that requires 
the right concentration of electrolytic solution. So you need a balance of sodium and potassium, and you need chloride, and you need all these different ions. And if you sweat a lot, you're sweating out a lot of those salts. That's why when your shirt dries, it's, it looks like white and crusty. That's if you've really been sweating. Um, because the, the water evaporates and it leaves the salt behind. All that salt came out of your body. It's not all table salt. But that's why they sell all these, you know, Powerade, Gatorade and stuff with electrolytes in them. Now, a lot of the time, honestly, um, I never sweat enough to need electrolytes, you know, to, to get them replaced. But, you know, if you're on the football team and you're practicing in full gear when it's 106, then yeah, you probably do. But electrolytes, that's the same word. Well, how does sugar dissolve? I mentioned it's a molecule, it doesn't form ions, but the sugar molecule um, also has oxygen and hydrogen in it. We'll learn more about this in a later chapter, we just have to kind of introduce it right now so we can talk about solutions. So in these oxygen-hydrogen bonds, there's also an unequal distribution of the electrons, and so the hydrogens are partially positive, and they will interact with the partially negative uh, water molecule. And so again, we're gonna get water molecules being attracted to different places on, the so on this uh, sugar molecule. And so you can see over here, those are, those are going to replace the attractions that held the molecules together as solid sugar. And so the individual molecules are free to move around. And even though this molecule is significantly larger, and sodium chloride, it's still way too small to see. So it appears to disappear. Any questions? We've talked about acids. We learn to recognize them because their formulas start with H and their names have the word acid in them, right? And we mentioned that acids are molecular compounds, but when you put them into water, they ionize they're going to form hydrogen cations, and the rest of the formula is going to be the anion. So hydrochloric acid, we take this H off, a hydrogen ion off, and what we're left with is a chloride ion. And so we're gonna get hydrogen ions and chloride ions. And this is ac acetic acid. You take the hydrogen off here, and then you get acetate ions and hydrogen ions. So it forms ions. The reason it forms ions is the water molecules partially start to pull apart the acid. There are strong acids and weak acids. Um, so a strong acid is one that ionizes completely. So something like hydrochloric acid, when you dissolve that in water, all of those molecules break apart. They ionize, they form hydrogen ions and chloride ions. In this picture, all we see are the individual ions. There's no intact molecules anymore. That's a strong acid. For a weak acid, some of the molecules ionize, but most of them do not. And so for HF, uh, hydrofluoric acid, acetic acid, when we write this equation showing how the acid ionizes to form ions, Instead of just a single arrow going forward, now we've got this double arrow, which means that this is not going all the way to the end. And in fact, what's happening is the reaction can go both ways. And so as these are dissolving, some of these are coming back together and forming that. It's an equilibrium, if you remember that from 3A. Yes? Okay, so that's a great question, and I know we had a, a few people come in a little bit late, so let's talk about that again, and I'm sure everybody else doesn't hurt to hear it again. So, so this is um, looking at the charge distribution of water. Water itself is a neutral molecule, but within that neutral molecule, the electrons are not distributed evenly. And so at the oxygen end of the molecule, it's a little bit negative. 
And at the hydrogen ends, it's a little bit positive. So it's not an ion. It doesn't come apart into oxide ions and hydrogen ions. It stays together, but one end is a little bit negative and one end is a little bit positive. And so water can interact with positive ions or with negative ions just by turning itself around. Does that help? So over here, in this beaker, um, acetic acid, we have, we have a couple of hydrogen ions that came off of the acetic acid molecules. And here's an acetate ion. But most of these are still the intact acetic acid molecule. And that's known as a weak acid. So we mentioned electrolytes and non-electrolytes. There are also strong electrolytes and weak electrolytes. And it, they go kind of like the acids do. It, a strong electrolyte is something that will dissolve completely as ions. And sodium chloride is something like that. All of the ions separate from each other. A solution with a strong electrolyte will conduct electricity well. So if you have it hooked up to a light bulb, the light bulb will glow strongly. It'll shine strongly, right? In a weak electrolyte, some of the molecules will ionize, but most of them will not. So there's not very many ions. And so it does conduct electricity, but only weakly. This is W-E-A-K. So here's a photograph of that. So here's the sodium chloride. That's a strong electrolyte, and we get a nice glow on the light bulb. The weak electrolyte, this is a weak acid, acetic acid. The light bulb is glowing, but it's kind of dim. It's not very strong, right? It's weak. And over here, nothing ha is happening because there are no ions in the solution here, and you have to have <coughs> ions to carry the electrons, which are the electric current. Any questions? So which of these aqueous solutions will conduct electricity? So we learned about two kinds of solutions that are electrolytes. Ionic compounds that are soluble and acids. Molecular compounds are not. So we need to use our nomenclature skills and look at this and identify mm -hmm. what they are. So is this an ionic compound? Yeah, it is. So that should be an electrolyte that should conduct electricity. What about this, C6H12O6? Yeah, that's a sugar, it's not, not an acid, it's not an ionic compound. That will not conduct electricity. How about this guy? So we see the hydrogen on the end, and that makes us think of acids. But in Chem 1A, acids always have the hydrogen first, right? This is methanol. It's an alcohol. And that hydrogen will not come off. It's just going to stay. So there are reasons that we write these things the way they do, we do. But what you should remember is, in this class, any formula that's an acid will start with H. H has to be the first letter. We will never write it backwards to trick you, because that would mean something else. And the name will also always have acid in it. So this is not going to conduct electricity either. Any questions? So the ionic compound, as it dissolves in water, we get a solution containing separated ions. But not all ionic compounds dissolve in water. So we use the words soluble and insoluble to describe those. 
It's soluble if it dissolves. It's insoluble if it does not. Now this is kind of the fine print, and um, we talk a lot more about this in Chem 1B. Even compounds that are considered insoluble will dissolve a teeny tiny bit. Because what if you put this chunk of ionic compound in water and four ions dissolve in this huge flask? Well, you can't really say that was insoluble, right? Because four ions came off. But is that thing going to conduct electricity, that solution? No, it's got almost zero ions in it, right? So when we talk about soluble and insoluble, it's not a black and white thing. There's kind of a middle part where we call it slightly soluble. Um, but we're going to try to keep to the ends of that spectrum. So as ionic compounds dissolve in water, the cations and anions separate from each other. So here we have sodium sulfide. It's got two sodium ions and a sulfide ion. And when you put this into water, those ions separate. And this is called dissociation. Association is when things come together, right? Dissociation is when they break apart. So we would say that an acid ionizes because it's forming ions that weren't there before. An ionic compound doesn't ionize because it already has ions. It's just that the ionized ions are going to separate. So it's called dissociation. If the compound has polyatomic ions, like this one, sodium sulfate, the polyatomic ion group is going to stay together because this sulfate ion is a sulfur and four oxygens that are covalently bonded to it, but then overall it has a negative two charge. And at this point in the semester, that just kind of has to remain a little bit of a mystery. Sometimes you just have to believe me. So I said that not all ionic compounds are soluble. If we take silver nitrate, we can dissolve that in water. It'll form a strong electrolyte solution. All of the ions will separate, and that would be um, that solution would conduct electricity. Silver chloride, though, is almost completely insoluble. For all practical purposes, it is insoluble. You put some of that in water, and really nothing happens. Now, the truth is, there's a very, very few, you know, a piece of sodium chloride that's large enough for you to see. Probably has, you know, a gazillion or a bazillion or something, some crazy large number, smaller than Avogadro's number, but still really, really huge. And so, you know, if a few of those came off, well, they dissolved. But does that really matter compared to the vast number that didn't? No, it doesn't. So we say this is insoluble. You can stir this and wait, and it's just never going to disappear. It just won't dissolve. So soluble and insoluble. So how can you tell? Well, it turns out that it's complicated. There are a lot of different factors um, that play into whether a compound will dissolve in water or not, and those factors are not easy to predict. And so what is actually the easiest way is what's called an empirical method by experiment. You do some experiments, you try the compounds. You put some in water and you stir it up. Did that dissolve? hey, that one's soluble. You stir this one up, nope. We'll wait a little, we'll come back to that one. Stir it up, nope. The, the solid's still there. Well, that one's insoluble. And so they went through all these different compounds to see if they were soluble or not. And what we end up with is a list of rules. Now, these are, these are rules, but there are some exceptions to the rules. And in your, I think it's the green piece of paper, the green uh, handout, 
has a list of rules like this, um, but it's a little bit different. They shouldn't conflict with each other, but this one might not have everything that the other one has. So, so this is the one we need to become familiar with, and I'm gonna show you how you use this thing. So in the top, these are compounds that are generally soluble. So if something has lithium ion in it, it's gonna be soluble. If it has sodium, potassium, or ammonium, all of those compounds are soluble. The exceptions are none, no exceptions. So ammonium phosphate, soluble. Ammonium chloride, soluble. Ammonium fluoride, soluble. Ammonium anything, right? The next one, those are all cations. The next one is nitrate ions and acetate ions. So if it has nitrate or acetate in it, it's going to also be soluble. Doesn't matter what the cation is. So you could have copper nitrate or you could have barium acetate, doesn't matter. You see one of these ions, that'll dissolve in water. And then we have um, three of the four chloride uh, halogen sisters here. Fluorine is the little one, breaks a lot of the rules just like hydrogen does. But here's chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So these are, are generally soluble, but there are exceptions. And the exceptions are listed over here. If you've got strontium, barium, lead to silver or calcium. Those are going to be non-soluble. So calcium sulfate will not dissolve. Sodium sulfate will dissolve. So one of these ions with sulfate is insoluble. These are the exceptions to the rules. The bottom half is showing us compounds that are usually insoluble and some exceptions. So if it's got the hydroxide ion or the sulfide ion, these are the exceptions. Those make it look more complicated than it really is because the way you should use this table is you should start at the top and go down. So if your compound has sodium in it, you're gonna get here, sodium, soluble, no exceptions, you're not gonna go any farther, right? It's soluble. You're not going to come down here and say, oh, hydroxide, well, it's, it's only soluble when it's one of these guys. These are the same guys that are up there. So my opinion is that that is just not necessary. That just clutters up my brain. Because you're going to take care of those up here. Um, Calcium, strontium, barium. Um, for the sulfide, those are soluble. For the hydroxide, they're slightly soluble. So we can just remember that calcium, strontium, and barium are exceptions. And notice that calcium, strontium, barium Here's calcium, strontium, and barium. It's those same three things. Here they made them soluble. Um, I'm sorry, here they made them insoluble, and here they made them soluble. And then we get down to carbonate and phosphate. And again, we see when those pair with lithium, sodium, potassium, or ammonium, those guys at the top of the list, they are soluble. So if we go down the table in order, if we get to carbonate, because we've passed all of these guys, it's going to be insoluble. So these guys, this is group 1A and ammonium. So lithium, sodium, potassium, the ions in group 1A and ammonium. Those are the exceptions in that they are always soluble. So there'll be exceptions for these guys down here. And those are the only cations that you see in this table. The rest of them are anions. Any questions?
So we're going to practice. Predict whether each compound is soluble or insoluble. So nickel sulfide. Well, what we want to do is we want to look at this table and start at the beginning. We don't have any of those ions. We don't have any of these, none of those, none of those. We're getting down here. Oh, we have sulfide. This is in the bottom. It's generally insoluble, except for calcium, barium, and strontium. But we've got nickel. So this is going to be insoluble. I think this is going to make a mess. So that one's insoluble. Magnesium phosphate. Again, start at the top. Do you see magnesium or phosphate anywhere? Not until we get all the way to the bottom. Phosphate is in the generally insoluble compounds part, and the exceptions were the calcium, barium, strontium. Those are the bigger ones in group two. But we've got magnesium, which is not one of those. If it had calcium, phosphate. No, never mind. This one, see if I point at it, it's going to get all messed up. These guys have the calcium strontium barium exception. These guys, if you did the table right, have no exceptions. So the phosphate is insoluble. So that one is insoluble. Lithium carbonate, soluble. The first row, right? Lithium, sodium, potassium, ammonium. You don't have to go any further. That one's soluble. NH4Cl, soluble. Okay. So, This is a list that I am not going to give you on an exam, but I'm also not going to try to trick you, but I think it's, if you break it down, it's not that much to remember. A lot of it is just the lithium, sodium, potassium, ammonium. Those guys are solu soluble. Nitrate and acetate, always soluble. These guys, you just got these few exceptions, and then these guys are almost always insoluble.